Hello and welcome to the Happiness Is podcast with me, your host, Bruce Aitchison from Happiness Is Egg Shaped. And today we are joined by a very special guest from very far away, but she used to be just down the road. I am absolutely delighted that she's taken some time out of her very, very busy schedule to have a wee blether with me. I was hoping that she was going to go back to her origins and speak properly, but it seems like she's been away from home for far too long. She finds herself in Japan as assistant coach to the national women's side. She's been a PE teacher. She's worked for Scottish Rugby. She's done a whole load of coaching. She's a Scotland international herself, and I am really, really looking forward to hearing all about how things are going. So without wasting any more time, please welcome the one and the only Louise Dalgleish. Hello, Daggy. Bruce, good to see you. <laughs> so, how on earth does Louise Dalgleish end up in Japan? Connections, I think, um, and probably just making the right choices at the right times, I think, was probably the kind of the root of it all. So, God, where, does that, where do I start from? Um, can I left teaching 2018 when I went to work for Scottish Rugby and the rugby development team and I think at that point there was a it was there was a lot of motivation around what else can I do in coaching and the job with the rugby development team just allowed a little bit more flexibility around that so as much as obviously there's so many benefits to teaching and the holidays and lots of other things and um, probably wasn't getting the flexibility that I wanted to develop as a coach so figured I'd give that a kind of Take a, take a step away from education, see what came up, see what happened. Um, alongside the work with the rugby development team, was doing some coaching within the Scottish Futures programme, was coaching at Edinburgh University, um, and then got the opportunity to go across to Stellenbosch as part of a women's rugby high-performance academy. Um, and it was from there that I met Leslie McKenzie, who's the current head coach of the Sakura 15s. And from that point, I kind of stayed in touch and then the conversation started to develop about a potential opportunity as an assistant coach. Um, then August last year came over and, and got started. So that's the probably the short-ish version. I absolutely love it, though, because that's such a rugby story. You went to a completely different place, you met some people, and you've ended up in a completely different place again. You've obviously you used the word opportunity a lot there. Kind of person that just, loves to take a punt at things probably not in a lot of respects like I'm a bit of a, a bit of a kind of theory in that sense of like a bit risk averse to some extent and always kind of like to know what's happening or what might happen and um, so in some respects the kind of step leaving teaching was a big enough kind of change for me and then the kind of weighing up of whether or not to take to take the chance to come across to Japan was um I think some people that know me would probably just be like kind of quite impressed that I'd actually made that made that jump. <laughs> so the, the people that know you, you don't make a decision like that without speaking to people. Who are your mentors that you discussed a big I mean this is not just a a rugby decision. This is a life decision. Who who were your mentors that you chatted this through with? I think it was probably quite a quite a few people like Chris Reed who used to who I used to who actually used to coach me when he was working with Scotland women but did a lot of work alongside um with the Scottish Futures program he's somebody who's kind of been in different situations has just got a really good manner so I had a great conversation with him um along the lines of do you think I'm ridiculous even kind of even going to try this like um how do you think it would go what what do you think I should what do you think I should do um and then I suppose a lot of a lot of closer friends and and family as well about the the change in lifestyle rather than just you know um, rather than just the step up of level in the actual job and the coaching role, but the the massive change of of life as well was that was the kind of friends being like it's fine we'll still be here when you come back go away to Japan see what happens and then yeah take it from there. And I mean Japan's not. It's not a lot like where you've come from and where you've been very recently. So how much of how much research did you do other than I'm going to get to be a professional coach? How much did you look at life? Um, probably not enough, if I'm honest. But I think the the benefit that I had is that Leslie, when she'd come across to start working in Japan, she'd been coaching in New Zealand. So she had gone through some of the initial 
I suppose, challenges of moving to somewhere that's a totally different culture. It's maybe got a completely different approach. So from that sense, she was brilliant in being like, you can maybe expect this to happen. Like, don't expect that to happen. These are some of the things that you should maybe kind of prepare for. Um, And I think that obviously helped massively. And then from that point, it was like, actually, this is an opportunity to go and be a full time coach, which is coming back to it. That's the reason that I left teaching. It's the reason that I've made other choices. So it was just too too tempting um, an offer to to not to not take on board with the kind of security and the, the reassurance that Leslie could give me about, you know, life will be all right. It'll be different, but it'll be all right. I just I love it. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's such a such a big thing. But you're you obviously love coaching, teaching. It's been something you've been involved with for such a long time. Um, you obviously love sport and developing people and working with people. What have you found in Japan that's similar to your experiences? And is there anything that you've raised your eyebrows at and went, whoa, I've never seen that before? I think the, in terms of, I don't, I don't know if it's that I've raised my eyebrows at, but one of the things that I've, I think is maybe one of the biggest challenges that I've probably always relied on is that ability for like small conversations and obviously to take that away with the language barrier and working through a translator um that's probably been one thing that I've kind of had to get used to um but in terms of of the similarities like the players are you know they're so willing to learn women's game is still probably not held in the same regard as the male game so there's a lot of challenges that that players will face but just being able to to try and work with them because they are so yeah kind of so enthused about getting better they want to learn they want to kind of go and challenge at the world cup so i suppose that motivation of athletes is 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 similar um and it's definitely been a, a kind of a huge positive for the squad that that i'm working with at the moment so small conversations as a teacher it's to the the kid that's last in or that needs that little bit of attention it's to your top performer who needs to be pushed it's to the middle group to to encourage you know it's relentless how on earth are you getting over that challenge then through a translator are are they just constantly on your shoulder um there's been various various kind of setups and, and scenarios but i've always got when i'm on field there's always a translator there delivering um kind of delivering the parts of the session I think the bits that I've have been challenged with and I've and actually have needed to get better at and probably still need to get better again are just making sure that some of my previewing of the sessions and my delivery of what I actually want out of um, on-field sessions prior to them has really got to be succinct and come back to maybe like coming back to the real key points or messages and making sure that that I can I can deliver them or I can bring the players back to them really easily so that they are clear on on the expectations. And in terms of the additional conversations, they still have to be quite planned. So I still need to, you know, get another member of the management team to to do translations, even if it's a one-on-one chat at the end of a day in camp, um, to pick up kind of things with players. Um, which, like I say, it is a challenge, but finding ways around it. And I think they're getting more used to me now as well. So there's there's bits where the language is starting to cross over. So that's definitely helpful. A little bit of mixture of hoik and Japanese. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what you'd call that, but it's... Um, <laughs> yeah, I still need to remember to slow down when I'm speaking. That's still a massive... When I get excited or when I get nervous, which are one and the same, I, I still speak far too quickly. So... I think even at times over here, everybody's a bit like, can you slow down? <laughs> Are the translators rugby folk or, or is their job just to translate? Do they understand the game? Can they pick up little nuances that you're trying to get across? It's a bit of a, in terms of our squad at the moment, actually that's probably a bit of a mixture. So our lead s and C is kind of very rugby focused and fluent kind of English and um, he kind of studied did a lot of work in New Zealand so he's brilliant in in that rugby translation and and working across not just the actual language but the the real meaning of the the game and um, I think our team manager who's also our line out specialist coach she's also kind of learning that and picking up 
the, the rugby side of it. Um, and then one of the other translators within the management team very much removed from the rugby side, but she's learning. So it's just, yeah, it's a bit of a mixture. Um, and yeah, that can, at times, we just need to be really careful. Again, coming back to making sure my message is clear and maybe doing a bit of prep with them before a conversation or before a meeting so that they kind of know what to expect and it just makes it all a bit smoother. As a CPD, this is absolutely phenomenal. Like what an opportunity to have. What are you finding that you're better at now than maybe you were before you got on the boat and, and went to Japan? I think the level of detail and and continually challenging my kind of knowledge, what I think I know, how I put that across, that's got like that's getting better. Um and what as I say continues will continue to need to get better as we kind of prep towards a World Cup. Um I think the yeah the the clarity of messaging and that how comfortable I am with the analysis side of the game and just what to look for and, and how to use that is is ramped up massively because I've had time to do it and it's been kind of a big focus to help me kind of help me learn about my players but help me kind of look for how they're going to how I want them to improve what we want to do next and um, and yeah just I think when you're working full-time in rugby you get so much more time to kind of to study the game more don't you and so you're constantly evolving your your wider knowledge of not just my own team and, and uh, what we're doing but the wider competitions that are going on globally the way teams are playing the different trends and and looking at things like that so yeah always like every or oh, every day is a school day isn't it so yeah there's always something new to learn at times the thing everybody wants even even at the top level coaches and players will say we want more time whether that's time for analysis or preparation or rest or whatever it may be everybody wants more time coming from full-time work to what's almost a full-time job on top of it with the coaching you were doing have you found more time to do other things away from the game so that you feel refreshed and energized when it is right I need to go and do my job now yeah, I'm probably getting better at that now. But I think initially I was like, I'm here as a full-time coach. Every minute has got to be about rugby. Everything I do has got to be about rugby. And it was kind of good advice from other people around me that were like, it's okay to have an afternoon where you're doing some reading or you're doing this or you're going out or you're whatever. Um, because I think, like you say, going from fitting everything in when it was so busy in life to then having this time and actually a lot of time kind of potentially well a lot of time on my own so that was even more disconcerting because I'm not used to like necessarily not being around either thousands of pupils in a school or a team in Murrayfield or whatever so um yeah all this all this spare say spare time but all this time that I was then managing and had loads of time to do my job but actually I was probably spending I probably wasn't being efficient or effective enough with it so that was yeah probably a big learning curve when I first arrived so when you first arrive, you pack your bags and you land at the airport. What what on earth happens? I mean, you what have you got? Two kit bags and and no idea what's going on. That's pretty much it. I had I bought myself a really large new suitcase to travel with, which was ridiculous. And then we over over wake coming over and that and a tradi- and an old school Scottish rugby wheelie bag actually, which clearly hasn't been back at the cupboard since I got here because. I, I can't do that with the brand inside. Um, but yeah, pretty much got picked up at the airport, got brought to my apartment in Kumagaya where I'm where I'm living, and then had to spend two weeks isolating because of COVID restrictions at the time in August. So yeah, it was a it was an interesting introduction to Japan. <laughs> and then you get a little bit of time to settle down and you go to your first session. I mean your heart rate must have been through the roof to turn up at your first session. I was I was a wreck. I was totally so nervous. Like I'm, I probably still get nervous going into camps now because I feel like I'm, I, f- I feel like I'm still the newbie in that sense. But um, yeah, I think the the first camp that we went to or that I was in Japan for was based in Kamaishi, so absolutely beautiful place in in Japan, um, and that was the day after I got out of my two week isolation period. So literally packed for camp 
went up to kind of meet the squad in Kamaishi and then spent, I think it was a five or six day camp. So had had a few days up there um, actually yeah, being front and centre and, and being with the team. So it was a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Your head must have hit the pillow on that first night and just be like, oh my, what have I done here? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know if it was, yeah, it was probably, yeah, mine was definitely, mine was definitely an overdrive, I think, probably spent the whole, the whole camp, but to be fair, Leslie and the team were very, in terms of how the camp had been planned and designed in the sessions, it wasn't a case of like, right, you're on, you're on the field first and you're leading this and that and whatever else, the, the kind of session design and, and how it was all put together was, was quite a, it was a nice kind of, in, in Kind of introduction um just to spend a bit of time getting to know the players and starting to pick up bits and pieces but not not have too much responsibility in that, uh, on me in that first camp which which i obviously really appreciated <laughs> in in my head right here's all the stereotypes coming um in japan everything's efficient everything's on time uh there's lots of ceremony so when a new coach comes into camp did you did you go through anything? Were there official things that you had to do? Was there any kind of welcome to you? Or was it just, there's your tracksuit, bring your whistle, we start at nine? Um, there wasn't too much ceremony, actually. They could obviously had some formal meetings before I arrived in um, before I arrived in Japan. So Kamaishi was quite nice in that sense because it literally, I think, show our manager had my kit was delivered to the hotel in Kamaishi so kind of turned up the staff meet the day before so we'd met we were able to have a bit of a chat about what the program was and uh, got my kit which is obviously still exciting regardless of what age you are or what, what team you're representing it's just like everybody <laughs> loves stash day <laughs> uh, so and then it was yeah it was it was just then a case of, of starting to meet anybody who um, who I kind of hadn't met out of the management team. Um, but like I say, most of the introductions had been done online prior to that. So it was a relatively easy kind of transition out of that first camp. And then one of your first jobs is to come to Scotland and play against Scotland. <laughs> I know, it's hardly been away. And then it was that. Um, yeah, which was brilliant. I mean, it was so nice because even you know being away for a couple of months by that point I think it gave me the you know did I forget anything and got my mum to pick up a couple of bits and pieces like take it back to them uh caramel wafers <laughs> and iron brew 100% caramel wafers and she made shortbread for enough for like the whole squad which was brilliant the whole squad don't know where near it because the management team we just pretty much kept most of it for ourselves um but the yeah just being able to be back and obviously first tour with a team after a couple of camps to be back in the UK and, and particularly at the damn health because I'd watched it being kind of watched the ground being dug up and watched it being built through the time working at Murrayfield so to to be able to be there as a as a visiting coach was quite a it was quite a surreal moment but absolutely loved it obviously just really enjoyed the whole experience. It must have been cool because you, you know I, I love being at Murrayfield and I'm there probably more often than I should be but you know you walk along and you, you bump into security and you bump into staff and you bump it you must have just been oh well you probably weren't allowed to but you must have seen so many people at least have a chat to and they would be all over you so pleased to see you. Oh, it was brilliant I mean that's the thing like walking along the first first training that we did at the damn health and um, seeing the ground staff seeing the boys and just being like how you doing like different tips um, Edinburgh were just coming off the pitch, so I had a good chat with Kitty McRae just as and we actually caught up then since when I got back. So it was just, yeah, so nice to to see all those familiar faces. And then obviously on on game day to see the kind of Scotland coaching team, the players and and some of the kind of medics and, and management team that I've worked with as well. So it was nice, really nice experience and, and good to be back. No, it was the result. I was absolutely gutted. I was due to be at that and thought he got COVID, didn't I? Uh, uh, it was it was quite a game as well. How how did you take the positives out of that game? I think in terms of the what we took out of the tour, there was always going to be massive learnings. And and from a attack point of view, some of the the things that we did against Scotland, I think we were more effective, even though we spent kind of sixty minutes playing with fourteen players. Um, 
I think there was lots of positives. And I think the big thing is the Six Nations teams had been, and, and some of the players within the Six Nations squads had been able to continue playing that maybe that bit more some of, over that COVID break. So to go from two years to hit a European tour, three Six Nations teams that um, had have their own ups and downs or whatever. But yeah, lots of a real good vision of where we are and where we were in comparison to those kind of squads and, and what we needed to take on and do next. And I think through each of the games, there was probably, there was improvements, there was learnings, there was things that we would change. And and as a coaching team, as well as as the players, to be in that test environment for three weeks back to back is obviously brilliant preparation and, and experience for us going towards the World Cup. Did you take a lot of feedback from the players about how you'd prepared and how you reviewed and you know, it was a chance for them as well, I suppose, to go through that experience looking towards the World Cup. Do you take a lot of feedback from the squad? Yeah, I think it's important. We've got some, there's a, a lot of our, our kind of our squad, as, as many do, broken down into different drivers groups and leadership groups in different areas. So there's there was ways that we would, you know, the different ways that we reviewed the overall performance after Ireland, but kind of after the, the tour in general, just looking at, not only them as individuals, but yeah, what collectively did we do right? What do we need? To, what do we want to focus on? And and some of those drivers groups with the ownership they have in certain areas of the game are are able to take that on, and that kind of helps us as coaches. It helps us be informed about what we want to do next. Give give us some insight. Uh, you know, I'm I'm naive to to what you're dealing with, and and I'm sure people that are listening will be wondering what is the picture like in Japan. Here we've got a mixture of student rugby players. Uh, some of the women are full time. There's some who are part time, but got full time contracts during the Six Nations. You know that there's a real mixture of experiences that that you know really well. What are you dealing with in Japan in terms of your squad makeup? There are, it's those that are, are are working are generally because of the way the, the club set up is they might have a job within the kind of company or business that's linked to clubs. So there's a bit of flexibility in their kind of training time and how much time that they are able to, to, to kind of access training for some of them. And um, for those who are involved in those type of clubs, there's still a lot of university players there as well. And some that are maybe just out of school or in that kind of level st still within education. So yeah, a bit of a mixture. So we don't have any, you know, full-time full -time rugby players. Um, but I think the other, probably the other big challenge that we have is the amount of time that clubs spend on or that, that is allocated to 15 season for Japan. So we've got players coming out and um, we've got players coming in who have very limited 15 aside experience that have maybe, you know, the club season maybe only played three or four 15 aside games and then they're coming into our environment and we're trying to kind of fill that gap and bridge that gap to then go and take on other other international sides. So I think yeah, the, the biggest difference is probably that 15 aside experience for us. So the what's the development pathway then for a for a japanese woman who wants to play rugby where do they start there's a lot of rugby in schools and i think the as they progress a lot of our players maybe would will st have started playing rugby relatively young so they've maybe had different experiences in um kind of early years in their schools there's times where that can drop off like after high school um and I think so those who are still playing, it might be that they've gone into a our kind of TID program from school if they've been if they've been at certain events that they've been kind of recognised or they've been selected from. Um, or they may just be picked up through clubs, through the national coaches seeing them at different sevens or sevens or fifteen aside competitions. Um, so I'd say that the kind of pathway is not it's not it's not established in Japan at the moment. There's not a clear under 18s, under 20s senior program route. There's there is work around the, the talent ID space um, and how that links to the the kind of the full squad. But that's also previously maybe been quite weighted towards sevens. So again, there's that balance of how everything fits together um, and how we make sure that we 
you know, as you say, a, a young Japanese female player, what how are they able to stay in the game? So there's it's probably not as clear a route as, a, as we would like it to be at the moment, but it's definitely something that's evolving and, and continuing to develop. So Japan's a big place. Population is massive. There's a lot of competition. Um, it hosted the World Cup way back when. Uh, softball, baseball are, are big in Japan. Do people know that there's a national, international women's rugby team? I mean, we still have that here where people say, oh, I, I didn't know women played rugby. What What's it like in Japan? How conscious are the public of rugby? I think it's improving. I think like everywhere, the more um, the more success teams have and the more visible they become through things like our European tour, then it starts to put that kind of front and centre of people's minds because, yeah, it's women's rugby is not a, it's not a big sport in Japan in terms of huge public following at the moment. So, but it's it's definitely moving in that direction, um, and I think knowing that the team are there, being able to see what happened on tour, you know, building those connections and and the work that GRFU do around their PR, but also the work that, that we can do by producing a, a, a kind of team that are performing at a high level that go to a World Cup and do well, that will can you know, that'll raise the raise the awareness again and hopefully just give another push on of the overall kind of profile of women's rugby in the country. Here you go then, I'm putting you on the spot. What does it mean for Japan to do well at World Cup? It's massive. Like I think in terms of, you know, we are saying that we want to really promote and drive the development of the 15-a-side game here. And I think what better way to show that that's, show that it's worthy of it and show that it deserves it by by being successful in, in that World Cup environment and showing that we're able to compete with, you know, the top, at this point, the top 12 teams um, the other well, the other 12 11 teams that are going to be there so yeah i think it's massive for us to be there and not just you know we're not just there as a um to, to play and to kind of get experience we're going there to be competitive and we're going there targeting to to win games well done that was a very media trained answer i like it <laughs> vague enough that you you shut me up <laughs> but not precise enough to hang your hang yourself so yeah i'll I'll move on i'll let you off with that one daggy so let's rewind all the way back you're a long way from hoik but i think you're are you number four from hoik i've interviewed tony stanger greg oliver graham hogg and now louise dalgleish and this week i see that the Female international players have just been uh, put up on the wall at Mansfield. So that's quite a big step for them that knows hoy and knows Scottish rugby and knows women's rugby. That's that's a big step. How aware of you were? How aware of that were you all the way over in Japan? Um, actually, really aware because there've been a lot of discussions happening for a bit of time now, um, even from. Uh, Murray Watson, who's involved with the White Memories Group, and Borthwick, who I'd, I'd I'd been down there to speak at Mansfield prior to prior to me coming over to Japan, um, and it was at that point there was there had already been a lot of discussion about why the the female players that had been capped from White why were they not being kind of recognised by the club, um, and so it's been in the process for a while, and like I think it was probably when Rory Banner was so. Bannerman was still president. There would be kind of advice to try and get to Derek Lunds to get photos taken and try and bring our caps in. And it was just a little bit, it kind of ended up being a wee bit messy. And then obviously COVID happened, so nobody could go anywhere. And then I think more recently, Malcolm Grant had taken that on and, and had just made a point of, of driving that forward. So yeah, now now safely on the wall at Mansfield Park. Yeah, it's brilliant. I was delighted to see that because they're, they're absolute role models and it's important for people to know that and where they've come from. Growing up in Hoyk, you're not telling me you had a female rugby role model to look up to at that time. No, well, technically, like I grew up in TV at Head, so I was like halfway between Hoyk and Langham um, in the kind of early early days and then kind of moved into Hoyk about, well, primary six or seven, I think it was. Um, yeah, I, I, again, like we said earlier, I don't think I knew that kind of women play rugby. Like I can remember watching Tony Stanger watching the Scotland teams on the telly, watching the Five Nations as it was. Um and then 
probably wasn't until uh, first year of like high school. I think it was an inter house competition. It was new image rugby or whatever it was at that point um, that I got involved in. And I was a little bit like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, I could give this a crack. Um, but then even then, it was another couple of years before I found out that Hoyt ladies had a team or had a, at that point had an under 16s team and then kind of rocked along to the PSA pitch. I used to train up there. Um, and then probably as a 14, 15 year old. And then that was like, Oh, actually, no, there are women that play rugby. And at that point, white ladies were, uh, you know, they were going well. They had a really strong squad and kind of then obviously started paying them even more attention to, to what was happening. So being in a town like Hoyk, there's not many one trick ponies. What else did you get involved in? You obviously became a PE teacher. So you, you would try other things. What other sports were you into when you were a kid? I think, un- unsurprisingly, probably played hockey right through school. So I would do kind of anything that was happening. Um, I was the one that would sign up for any kind of inter-house activity. Probably terrible at some of them, but we'd always give it a crack. Um, but no, I weekends used to be, it would be like probably a Saturday morning would be would be school hockey. Saturday afternoon would be kind of played for white ladies hockey for a while and kind of linked into some of the borders teams. And then... Sundays would be rugby so yeah the weekends were were full on sport and not having something to to aim for in terms of professional sport were you always going to be a PE teacher was that always where your future lay I think so I think I'd, I'd been adamant I wanted to wear a tracksuit to work that was probably one of my main motivations <laughs> yeah I hear you <laughs> then when I started and went into guidance for a while I was just like kind of you know being a little bit more suited and booted for for some days um and then clearly just came back to coaching so that I could or going back to coaching clearly went into coaching so I could start running a tracksuit more again that's the uh, motivation behind my career changes so who who did you look up to who were not necessarily the posters on your wall but who did you look at in sport and think I'd like to be like them I wish I had a bit of that I'd like to do something like that I think early years, who did I look up to? That's like, I think that some of the people that I first remember seeing are maybe kind of some of the athletes, like a Sally Gunnell type, that era, like thinking, oh, okay, they're going to kind of Olympics, they're doing things like that. Um, because again, the f- like female role models in, in team sports probably weren't, you know, they probably weren't there or we didn't, they definitely weren't as accessible because um, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't social media, there wasn't so much coverage on on TV um, or anywhere else. So I probably, yeah, early days, it would be kind of more athlete based from a from a kind of role model point of view. Um, but then I guess in real life, PE departments in schools always have such a massive impact on people, don't they? So, you know, it was May Cully, Sarah Knox was there. It was, you know, Sandy Greaves, Sandy Wilson in the, in the PE department at Hoyt High School. And as anybody who then goes on to study PE teaching, you spend your fifth and sixth year predominantly in the PE staff base or around about the department. So I've got to give a fair amount of credit to them as well. Yeah, happy days. The good old days, Daggy, the good old days. <laughs> so you'll not give yourself much credit here, but I'm going to try and push you on this one. You then become that PE teacher um, and somebody whose name was in the paper and, you know, somebody that the kids would be aware of but depending on the situation sometimes the kids couldn't care less what you did outside the school it was how you dealt with them in the p hall the swimming pool the corridor the changing room whatever it is but there must have been some who took a big interest in what you were up to did you get a buzz out of that yeah i think right through the time i was playing it was so those who knew like a lot of the like you say, the, the pupils that did take an interest in that and really paid attention, it was it was brilliant. And it was so nice to be having those conversations and spent a lot of my teaching days at Ross High in Trenent. And I think a couple of a couple of things that really stood out, it's like one day going in with a black eye, as you do. I think it was against, it was actually after a game against England. Um, and clearly, like some of the boys in the corridor are not going to kind of pass any comment on the nature of, of the characters. Like, oh, I miss you've been fighting. Yeah, 
yeah, I'd say, like, oh, it's kind of T Y T. It's just like but a bit of banter with them. They're like, oh no, what really happened? And I was like, oh, I was playing rugby. And they're like, oh, you must be a total tank. Like that chat. It's just like I'm clearly not a total tank in rugby terms because I'm tiny compared to some people. But um, just getting that like banter and engagement with them was brilliant. And then the ones that did really kind of take an interest in rugby, I think. It's probably actually John Smith, who's now doing a lot of refereeing. Yeah. Um, his class, I must have had them on a Monday morning. And we'd, I'd go in to teach, like, it would be an SE class or whatever, and there was just, they'd have the score up on the board from the weekend, like, or they'd do something that would just be like... And at that point, for Scotland women, we probably weren't in a particularly good run of form. So it was never necessarily a positive discussion. But I just loved the fact that we were able to go and start off on that foot and then have a bit of chat about it and be like, right, OK, let's let's move on now. So, yeah, um, it was yeah always good to have those kind of conversations and, and hopefully do a little bit to kind of push them on in whatever whatever areas they were kind of focusing on outside of school. I, I can picture that and I can I can actually hear a kid going, you must be a tank, because that was a phrase for a while, you must be a yeah. tank. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I clearly took it as a huge compliment at the time, because, yeah, like I say, I'm not the biggest or the strongest, but definitely was just like, oh, yeah, 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 I am, don't mess with me, you know. I remember there was an advert on the TV a few years ago and it was to try and encourage people to get into teaching and the, the teacher had a mug, I think it was like an Arsenal mug on the on his table and a kid walked in giving it the 2 nil or something like that. Was like, that was far too tame for what it's actually like in real life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, you're right. See, there's an example. John is now refereeing and took up the whistle really young, probably because he was hopeless at playing. I don't know. You'd, you'd know more than me, but you'll have played a part in inspiring that. Do you give yourself any credit? Do you reflect on those things or is it too early in your career? Oh, I think, I mean, I'd like to think that through some of the rugby chats, it was kind of supportive enough for, for him to kind of keep going and, and you know, know that that was a kind of good avenue or, or know that that was available. But I reckon John's like, he's somebody who was probably quite motivated anyway. And, and when he got into that rugby kind of, that refereeing, um, that refereeing set and he was good at it and he's been doing really well. So, um, I mean, maybe ask him. Like, I don't know. I'll maybe take a wee bit of credit just for some of the extra rugby chat, but that's, that's probably about it. He, he taught in some in some great schools out in East Lothian and, and I know them well. And Ross High, I know really well. I love Trinent. I love Ross High. I go back to the club often and, and blether there. Do you look back on those times and you wonder, I wonder where that kid is now? I wonder what happened to them? Hundred percent, like so many of them, and I and and actually, if I'm, so I suppose when I went to work for Scottish Rugby in the rugby development role, one of the things that they kind of was a pretty much a kind of active choice was that they were going to the clubs that I would work with, where the East Lothian, predominantly East Lothian, and then some of the Borders clubs, which I absolutely loved because the Borders clubs that I got were Duns, Kelso, and and Berwick, so looking at the connection so one of my my probation year was at Berwickshire High School my third year placement was at Berwickshire High School so the the rugby club now is essentially the old PE department so when I kind of walked in there for my first meeting with Bert Gregg who's the DO at Duns it was just like I mean even Bert was probably at the school when I was it was just yeah so it kind of starts conversations and then walking into Ross High on one of the days of their games most of the first 15 I've either been a PE teacher or a guidance teacher for so it's just yeah it's it's nice to see them and hear what they've been up to and, and how they're getting on. You must have been at Hoyt High School when I did my placement there. Your placement at Hoyt did I? Yeah, maybe. So I was 90 when did I leave school? 99? 99 I went to uni so yeah Oh, no, you'd have just left. You'd have left. Aye. Okay. Uh, so you then you then start playing. You've mentioned playing for Scotland. How do you, how do you play for Scotland and have a full-time job? I think, yeah, as, as many people are still finding, like it's challenging and it's all about time management and it's all about knowing that you, like if you're putting, if you're putting a full-time job and... A commitment to rugby together then you're probably taking out other areas so you're knowing that you're making an active choice that you know you're not going to be able to 
attend family events or go to certain things or spend so much time in kind of holidays or socialising or, or whatever else because your holidays from work invariably I mean obviously I was lucky as, as a teacher but your time of work is for rugby or you know you're constantly managing the training or the expectations in between so um, I, I guess I, what I would say is I was really lucky even from my probation year at Berwickshire High School that the schools that I worked at were really supportive in terms of not making it too difficult to get time off like East Lothian Council and the head teachers at, at Ross High they would you know we would work out the best way of doing it it would just be about kind of good communication with them and getting their support and then um working around it as as best we could so it didn't miss anything um but yeah I think the tough bits were probably that like driving from East Lothian to to the gym at BT Murrayfield on a horrible dark December night and you can't get into the gym until a certain time so you're you know it's you're stuck in traffic coming around the bypass and you're just like what's what what is this about uh, on a Friday evening on a Wednesday evening or whatever um but yeah it's it's a choice a choice that we make and fortunately now it's moving towards less players having to have that real full-time commitment um on top of the rugby full-time work commitment on top of rugby but obviously still still changes that could be made and hopefully progression further progression to come you obviously loved it though and you've never mentioned the word sacrifice which i love i think the first thing you said was active active choice you obviously loved it what what was it that kept you going round the bypass on a wet you know wednesday night in december the teams wasn't it like it's always the kind of teammates in that bigger picture of what you're doing it for so I am um, yeah I think we had a great wee training group that that were at kind of the gym at Murrayfield we put our share CD on you know get really pumped in the, the gym <laughs> that, was, that was a standing joke for a long time because the share CD kept going missing so yeah we um needed to dig that out occasionally but who no. who was the training group come on name check them who was your training group who did we have i'm trying to think well beth dickens was definitely in the mix so it was like sarah louise walker beth dickens sarah gill was either there I'm sure she would be involved in the share chat kerry holdsworth um yeah that, that kind of group that that trained together in edinburgh so um it was always you knew when you got there that it was you, you were going to enjoy that kind of time with with the teammates and with your squad mates. So, yeah, it was uh, it, it made the drives. It made the yeah sitting in the car worth it. Who do you look back on and you think they were a proper player? Like who did you play with and you think they they were very very good at what they did? I think there's probably a few. I mean, Donna Kennedy's an obvious one that that jumps out. She was obviously playing um, when I started and, and having her as as an eight when I was then kind of moving and starting to, to play a nine was phenomenal. Um, ahead of me, like Paula Chalmers playing nine prior to like, just when I was coming into the squad. Um, some of those kind of Rima who was playing at the time was just a phenomenal athlete. So um, a lot of people around that era that, um, yeah, that, that really stood out and you just wanted to be better because they were, you know, they'd set the standard. They were, um, they were good rugby players. They'd done a lot for Scotland women, and you wanted to kind of work towards that and kind of emulate that. Um, who else? I mean, Lucy Millard for kind of ability, footwork, finishing over the years that I was playing. Um, like I said, we maybe didn't have the most successful run over that period of time, but um, Lucy was just somebody who was always a, an attacking threat and, and just great, um, great to have in the field. You had to endure a lot in that period. I think your your group, the game had moved from being kind of keen amateurs to probably serious amateurs. I'm trying to work out a, a term here to the group that are now around that are benefiting from the hard work and effort that you guys put in, not just in the way you played, but the role modeling and the contribution you've given back you know, Claire Cruikshank, I know you worked with at Edinburgh Uni, and there's there's so many women who were so passionate about the game who are putting back in. What do you think is the legacy of that era that that you played in? 
I think the what's the legacy? That's a. I think probably from a not to just hark back to oh, it's, you know, it was tough times. It was tough times for a lot of squads, and and Scotland were not the only ones. But I think you're right that that transitional period, other unions maybe made choices to invest more. I feel like there was a period of time that Scotland went from from actually being quite competitive as a small smaller nation around about the era of kind of Paula Chalmers and that kind of 2006 World Cup kind of time. Um, as we as other teams moved forward, it felt like Scotland just maybe got stuck a little bit and then the gap maybe opened up, um, which I think is now very much closing again or, you know, overlapping with other kind of other other teams. So I don't know if that says what our legacy is. I mean, we're still going. I think there was a time where there was discussion about whether or not Scotland women should remain in the Six Nations and there was conversations with MSPs. There was different things kind of happening in the background. So I think the big thing is that now the union see the importance of the women's squad and the, the choices, you know, from back when maybe when it was Sheila Begbie that, that took on that head of, of women and girls' role, putting in full-time coach, putting in a full-time SNC, putting in the full-time physio, that was the initial moves that started that kind of regeneration, if you like. So I think, yeah, it's easy to look back and be like, oh, that was really difficult, but you know, it was what it was. We've got through it. Hopefully, the players now have got some understanding of maybe, you know, what other other people have had, had gone through, and and that can inspire them to just take on and push on Scotland women to be in an, an even better place. Yeah, I, I love it. That that period of time were the World Cups your highlights? Well, I think I they probably. Um, they probably were like 2006, just as a totally young kind of fresh player getting to go to Canada, um, like my mum coming over to watch. Um, you must have felt to, like a rock star. It was amazing. And, and getting to, I think we we played New Zealand in the pool matches at that stage. And I think that was at a time where New Zealand pretty much only played in World Cups. You didn't, there wasn't... Um, there wasn't test matches between that so to play against the Black Ferns at that point in my career it was just you know mind-blowing and, and such a such an exciting kind of experience and um, 2010 obviously as a more established player was a different you know different experience but the fact that it was in England meant that we had a load of home support and stuff which was good Um but yeah so I think they'd, they'd probably it's hard not to be a highlight but then there's so many other moments in games, you know, win or lose that stick out. Um, the French game in the 2010 Six Nations when we kind of beat them at last Wade on a horrible Friday night. Um, you know, Lindsay Smith trying to knock me out in the changing rooms at Twickenham pre, pre Six Nations match when we were on the wrong side of a pretty horrendous result there. It's, I mean, you know, th- there's plenty more highlights in there as well as World Cups. Uh, I always, I always say this to people I get a chance to speak to and you know I never played to the level you played at I can remember about three results in my lifetime the bit I would give anything for is to be back in the changing room what changing room do you miss the most that's a tough one as I yeah um, I, yeah, I reckon just being kind of in with the Scotland team, like, yeah, it's probably any game. Like, I think that, yeah, a- any time with them, it was always just that that whole kind of shared purpose, what you're there for. Yeah, good teammates. Although, IHC Cougars was always good fun. So, you know. Club changing in the country, it's always going to be a slightly different vibe, so I, I maybe shouldn't compare them. But. Yeah, I can, I can imagine that bunch of cougars having a grand old time. The the bit I look at now and I see, you know, you see pictures in the changing room that are obviously not just off mobile phones, they're from proper photographers floating around the changing room for the social media. I get all that. That that wasn't there when you played. There There must be moments from squads you were in teams you were in where there was no cameras the door was closed you saw people at their absolute best their happiest their absolute worst injury defeat all those things what 
what has that done to help you become Louise Dalglish, the woman, not just not just the rugby player, being involved in that environment? What's that done? I think there's probably that respect and understanding for how like people's differences. So you know, you 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 pick out, you know, your teammates that need a bit of, need a bit of extra space, or you start really understanding the the needs of individuals rather than it's not everybody's not they don't behave the same way win or lose they don't behave the same way after a challenge or after an injury so it just feels like that connection with the with the people and how well you can kind of understand the people around about you I think is probably what I take from that and what you kind of see in those environments that is not like say it's not kind of a photo of it it's not a moment it's it's just being there and, and going through it with with others. When you look at the game now and you know we're we're into the Six Nations uh, here, and there's so many positive role models. TikToker, a headline sponsor. We still don't actually know what that means, but they've put their name to it. They're helping to promote it. What do you look at now and think that's why girls should play the game of rugby? I think the, the whole, I suppose the whole package, like it's, we know that rugby's always been a sport where everybody's got a, an opportunity to do well, like in terms of, of differences and forwards and backs and, and how how you can grow in a game. Um, and I just, but I think the coverage that it's getting now, the enjoyment that you're seeing, that you, you get from some of the behind the scenes footage and how people speak about their teammates, like it just shows what a positive environment a kind of a rugby team can be and um, so not only the kind of athleticism and the training side that's involved but also just that like some of the, the content on TikTok is just it's just really it's engaging because it's fun and it's people that are from loads of different backgrounds really connecting with a whole load of young female players that are now aspiring to be rugby players when yeah we've, we've not had that before so it's it's brilliant to see and it's just so exciting to to watch how it's progressing and, and watch how it's continuing to develop. What does rugby do for body positivity for women? Hopefully still a lot. I mean, some of the, the strength and the athletes that the kind of strength and power that we see in some of the international players across the game um, and the messages behind that and just making it, you know, they can they can be so strong and powerful and dynamic on a rugby pitch, but then the flip side of the social media is that they can also see them in their real life and how kind of glamorous they can be or or how just how how they are in everyday life as well. So it just I suppose reinforces that it's okay to be it's okay to be big, it's okay to be strong, it's okay to be small, it's okay to be whatever. And hopefully that yeah young people are are really picking up on that and they can celebrate the kind of real strong, strong female athletes that, that rugby is showcasing and, and doing a really good job of. All right, get your crystal ball out. What does what does rugby look like in ten years time for for the women's game? Go globally I'd say there'll be much more professionalism across not just kind of certain countries and leagues, but I think just as an overall um, package I would I think the ex kind of the fifth women's 15s competition will hopefully continue to inspire and push on the the global nature of it so the likes of the South American countries the likes of the African nations so seeing a real kind of push in in lots of lots of that kind of development so I think we'll see many more countries I think we'll probably see variations in, in law changes, but I, I would hate to predict what they'll be. Um, so, yeah, and I think we'll see them fill and I think we'll see stadiums, big stadiums being absolutely full um, coverage, our female athletes being celebrated the same way that our male athletes kind of are in, in terms of real, yeah, continuing to be role models, but kind of getting that recognition and, and hopefully from a kind of, contract payment just that that whole experience of um of what kind of male players are maybe kind of access at the moment but just making sure that it's you know women's players are, are able to access that as well 
I love it. Right. Keep your crystal. Woefully, woefully answer. Sorry, Bruce. No, no. I love it. I, I love it. It's a, I didn't tee up for any of it. So it, you're, you're just speaking from, from the time I give you. Keep your crystal ball out though. Where's Louise Dalgleish in 10 years time? Uh, where am I in 10 years time? Probably retired on a beach with a cocktail. <laughs> Um, is that the money you're getting paid? Is that why you win? <laughs> no, not from a financial point of view, but uh, I know. Hopefully, yeah, who knows, Bruce, who knows? Because I think it's um, the way that rugby is evolving, where, where an opportunity is going to come up, I don't know. Like there's, you know, kind of only been not even a year in Japan. So hopefully kind of work to be done here, but there might be a, a opportunities elsewhere. So that's a... I think where I'd like to be is probably still a full-time coach, maybe heading up a program somewhere um, with a few other experiences along the way. That's all I'm going to give you. Back at Murrayfield? Maybe. Who knows? Never say never. Never, never say never. Say- Never say never. Okay, okay. I love it. You need to warn me. Like, I can't just decide when I'm going to be. So it's the same Ten years' anything. time, you'll be naming your price, naming your job. <laughs> you'll, you'll be all over it. I've got no doubt about that. I absolutely love it. I've loved speaking to you. Time has flown past, Daggy, and I've almost got the hoik accent back out of you, but you're still holding on to this... Uh, this international accent that you've acquired. I don't know how that would go to the Trinidad either, but... Uh, I've got one question. I did tee up for this one, but you've not really had a lot of time to think. For you, Louise, happiness is? A good chat and a glass of wine with friends. Okay, okay. And are some friends lining up a a jaunt to Japan now that the world's opening up? Uh, Hopefully, yeah. I mean, I'm not good. Well, depending on what my schedule looks like, I think that'll be the challenge, but yeah. I, I would love that is a that is a fly on the wall that that's TikTok all over it when Hoik visits Japan. Well, I think um, I've done a bit of chat with Ian Landos and, and Murray Watson prior to coming out here, and Ian's already teamed me up for a book from TV Head to Tokyo. That was the book title. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I could imagine. Did it? Did it let Landos visit? <laughs> that, that could be interesting that's definitely get channel four or or itv or something to follow that tv at heed to tokyo yeah that's that's the route we're going i thought it was quite catchy actually so yeah i like that well get writing in the spare time you've got you can start yeah. writing i'm on it what's, I'm on it. What, what's the what's the best away from rugby what's the best thing you've found in japan what's the thing that you think i can't get this anywhere else and i love it Oh, the just at the weekend, actually, kind of onsens and hot springs and some of that hot bath stuff is just, yeah, kind of really, that, that's been good. And obviously, I'm, the food is amazing, but that's two things. Sorry. No, it's all right. I love that. I, I spoke to Greg Laidlaw between Christmas and New Year, and he was telling me in Japan that uh, you have KFC for Christmas meal. It's, yeah, common. You have to book it really early um, to make sure you get it. I actually went, didn't go for KFC. I went for an Indian instead. So yeah, really, you're, you're a long way for TV heat now, Daggy. Are on Christmas Day? Yeah, <laughs> that is magic. That could be a that could be a tradition that you bring back with you, or wherever you go. I don't know if you're coming back. Wherever you go, you get to take over the world. I reckon. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Daggy, thank you so much. I've absolutely loved speaking to you. All the best. And I can't wait to see how Japan go with, with Hoik at the helm. Brilliant. Cheers, Bruce. Lovely to speak to you. Speak to you soon. Bye bye. Cheers. See you later. Absolutely love it. How good was that? From TV at Heed to Tokyo, Louise Dalgleish, uh, working with the Japan women and no doubt the future is very, very bright. If you've enjoyed it, you can catch us on Apple and Spotify because Acast have taken their ball and gone home. You can watch on Facebook and on YouTube. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review. Remember, if you can't say anything nice, then they say anything at all. Tell your friends. You can go back and look at the back catalogue. I'm sure there's other episodes there that you can enjoy. Louise Dalgleish is doing great things and spreading the rugby gospel from Hoik all the way over to Japan. And then she's heading for the World Cup. It's going to be brilliant to watch that journey. My name is Bruce Aitchison from the Happiness Is podcast and my happiness is egg-shaped. Stay safe and I look forward to speaking to you all again very, very soon.